Hello, everyone. Um, wherever you are in Malaysia, India, or anywhere else, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Badan Warisan Malaysia's talk series. I'm Anand Krishnan, an architect and uh, a council member of Badan Warisan Malaysia, and your moderator for today. We've had this is the second talk uh, on our Art Deco uh, series. And um, as you know, Art Deco is a movement um, that started in England. It was, it's very modernist and elegant. It's a, a wonderful period in arch world architectural history. It spread to many parts of the world, uh, including India and Malaysia. Uh, last week, we heard Atul Kumar um, present uh, Art Deco in Mumbai. And today we're, we're having a wonderful talk um, about Art Deco in Malaysia. Our speakers today are Yvonne Leong, an architect, and Sim Dr. Simon Sun, an academic at the University of Malaysia, um, rather University of Malaya. They work together on a hundred year commemorative book on the work of BP Architects, one of the oldest firms uh, in Malaysia. In it, many Art Deco buildings were presented. Now, before, before we actually uh, start the talk, um, I'd like to make a few reminders. Uh, if you have questions, send them to the Q&A box and I'll ask them during the Q&A session at the end of the talk. Please state your name and uh, where you're from. The talk itself will be about for, uh, 40 minutes. It'll be quite interactive, so um, uh, make sure you have uh, your questions and, and uh, Dr. Simon and uh, Yvonne would, would start uh, talking about what Art Deco is all about. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Yvonne and Dr. Simon. Please, it's all yours. Thank you, Anand. I think Simon will do. Yeah, right. Depends with the formality, right? <laughs> yeah, same here. It's good to be with uh, all of you today at Badan Warisan. Lovely to see everyone here. Thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah. So we've got an interesting talk for you today. We've called it Eyebrows and Flagpoles. Uh, you must be wondering what makeup we'll be using, but uh, there will be none of that today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Instead, we'll be using these two um, identifying things to be looking out for Art Deco in Malaysia mm -hmm. as a feature. And we'll slowly unpack that a bit as we go along. Uh, but before we start, we want to start with KL and the history of KL. As we so know, far, KL. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. As we know, KL started um, as a muddy confluence, right? Kuala Lumpur of the Klang and Gombat rivers. Tin mining was, was the main cause for, the, for its development. And by 1883, Malaya was the largest tin producer in the world, and KL was the capital of Selangor. It was at the turn of the century with the automobile industry boom, there was a surge in demand for rubber. So the British started opening rubber plantations across Malaya. And by 1930, Malaya's rubber output was half of the world's demands. So it's quite easy to say that our wealth or the wealth of, the, of Malaya started and Kuala Lumpur itself started based on these two foundations of tin and rubber. And that's where we want to start today. And I love the map that you have chosen to, uh, you know, uh, tell us a bit about, you know, what Kuala Lumpur's urban morphology looked like. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the map? You yeah, the so I, I found this map somewhere online. I should have done a better job, I guess, um, remembering where I got it from. But it's obviously some AAM map um, and it's highlighted this main thoroughfare, the one in red, that is Java Street, um, which is also known as Jalan Tun Perak today. Um, and that oh, leads back then known as Mountbatten Road, is it right? Yeah, not yet. So Java then became Mountbatten and later became um, Jalan Tun Perak. But mm -hmm. this map shows it still as Java. Okay. Um, but as we can see, the two rivers, that's where it is. That's where they meet. And that's where Masjid Jamit would be. Mm -hmm. So a lot of KL actually started from here. So mm -hmm. you find a lot of the older KL buildings all following these main arterial roads, um, even as they went and spread out over the sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
And we'll be looking principally at that concentration of building. And our focus period is really the 1930s, where Art Deco took the new shine, right? Uh, yeah. And that's really helping to reinvent KL's urban scape. Hmm. So why, why Art Deco? Simon, what do you think? Why Art Deco as the main um, architectural language for that period? Right. I, I think, uh, it, first of all, we have to think of Art Deco not as, uh, it, it is a localized sort of like style. It was adapted and, uh, and localized in uh, many different places around the world, but principally it's a really internationalist style, right? Mm. I think it's probably one of the first international style uh, that was adopted in different places all over the world. Uh, I, I think it made its sort of like formal debut right after the war around 1925 yeah. the World's Fair in Paris. And from there, uh, you know, you see an interest uh, uh, coming from groups of architects, interior designers who banded together, you know, to develop a style that was in many ways aesthetically and philosophically responding to uh, a preceding movement called Art Nouveau, mm -hmm. where there was uh, a, a huge interest in delicate design and the use of often very expensive materials and uh, production methods. Yeah. I think after the World War I, there was a fallout in terms of fashion. It was, Art Nouveau was seen as ill-suited uh, you know, uh, to a challenging and very unsettled and much more mechanized sort of <laughs> modern world, right? And, and yeah. therefore, uh, the kind of intricacy that was uh, associated with Art Nouveau, with all the filigree, with all its references, mm. references to nature, gave way to something more streamlined. Uh, something more angular, something more uh, expressive of yeah. the sheen age that embodies progress and modernity. Mm, mm. Okay, so this, this is a page that's actually taken out by, uh, from the Encyclopedia of Malaysian Architecture. It was written by Chen Run Fi. Yeah. Um, so they are, it's a good guide um, that we can use actually because many of these features are actually very commonly found on our particular specimens of Art Deco buildings that we have. So we want to start with what is a very well-known building, and it is probably the first first Art Deco building in KL. Probably the first. I cannot think of anything earlier. Yes, uh, but we would stand corrected if you know anyone in the audience is like to correct us on this point. <laughs> <laughs> so this building was famously designed by Arthur Oakley Coltman. He was, of course, from the practice of Booty and Edwards. And Arthur Oakley, as you will find out, uh, designed actually many art. Deco buildings in KL. He went on to do quite a fair bit. Uh, fact, this is one of his like made his this. This was his first mark in KL, right? It mm, was, that's right. And was was a uh, was a firm that was initially established in Singapore, and then uh, you know Coltman decided to bring it up to KL, and mm. fact, we could yeah. argue this was his big break. Yeah. So um, what we discovered was it this building was originally the Eastern Smelting Company but uh, many actually just remember it as the Lee Rubber Building. Um, it, it's got a very interesting way of addressing the corner. So it sits at a junction um, mm -hmm. and yet it doesn't just, you know, butt right up against the junction. It just kind of chamfers and takes a step back at a 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. And we see Copeman later, actually he refines this thinking a bit more where the, the buildings start to become a little bit more curvaceous um, and a little bit more gentle around the corners. We'll see that in the later some of his later buildings. Okay, so eyebrows, as you can see, eyebrows are actually, it's just basically a horizontal band, but it's usually the one that's right on top of the building. It's the highest horizontal band and it's usually continuous. Um, we were just joking that if it goes all the way around, it's a... A Frida Kahlo or something. Yeah, right. It can be a unibrow almost. A unibrow, you know. <laughs> um, but in this, is it, in this instance, it's just on, on both wings of the building. Um, and then, of course, with that very prominent flagpole at the top as well. So this building has many uh, decorative uh, motifs that go around. And as you can see, they're all very uh, geometric, very, um, very sharp edges, very clean, uh, very clean lined. Um, we want to draw your attention to an interesting building that we discovered in Kota Baru. Um, this is actually a building for the Lee Rubber Building. 
it's called a Libra rubber building as well, but it's in Kota Baru. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it kind of looks similar. It has eyebrows and flagpoles, and but then not really. <laughs> uh, much more pat down, no? Uh, and would be probably belong, if you classify this, would belong to a later period. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I, I don't know any more about this building. I don't know, Simon, if you've come across anything. No. Except that the Chinese characters are similar. Uh, yeah. so, uh, clearly, uh, that, that, that it draws references from Holtman's yeah. building. Uh, but I think it sits at the other end of the spectrum, right? Which is mm. the southern end of the spectrum. And we would like to just highlight this at this point. Yeah. So that we can come back to this issue of how we can address the spectrum between Art Deco and the modern period, because really uh, we, uh, the relationship between these two styles uh, is something worth exploring further. Yep. The Oriental Building, I'm sure most of you who uh, have been in KL would have seen this building. It's a very imposing monolith. Um, unfortunately, today is a bit more obstructed by the LRT line that runs right in front of it. Yeah. But when it was built, it was like high rise and uh, one of the highest building, the tallest mm, building. In modern, yeah. Uh, and I imagine uh, the map that you showed earlier, which was uh, actually accentuating Java Street as the main thoroughfare for motorists traveling north and south of uh, True KL, right? So. Yeah. The oriental building situated right smack right at the center of this would have made been a statement piece yeah so the oriental is actually very very clearly art deco uh why so it's got very very distinguishing art deco features along its facade along the, the face of the building um you see a lot of these kind of uh, design patterns this is the acanthus leaf and that actually goes right around this site it goes all around the building in fact um, you even see this little coin so the the oriental building was was for an insurance company so it's both yeah. greek and china at the same time <laughs> yes yes <laughs> um, and then even in these vertical elements you know there's some sort of a very highly articulated kind of um, playfulness uh, in the way that the, the plaster is used to step down to create all these very, very clean and highly articulated lines vertically. And in fact, in our part of the world, the plaster that's used is known as Shanghai plaster. Right? I don't know if you've done much more research about it, but uh, mm. principally that has been a very malleable kind of like material that's used to uh, create all these very playful and whimsical yeah. things so that uh, the decorative sort of like feature of building facade can be taken up a notch almost. Yes. So between the Oriental building and this next building that we're looking at, there was a bit of a break because that was when the Great Depression hit us, this part of the world. So work actually came to a halt for about three, four years. There was nothing much going on. Nobody had much work. But immediately after that, when things started picking up again, you would see now in very quick succession, a series of buildings that Copeman continued to design for KL. So starting with the Rubber Research Institute, I think many people have um, called this like a mini version of Gotham City. <laughs> it's, it looks very imposing, but it's actually just a single story building. Uh, very eye-catching facing bricks. Uh, in high contrast with clean and smooth concrete plaster vertical elements. But I think the cost, um, if you were to drive down Ampang Road, uh, mm. the building coming quite very close to uh, the left side, if you're driving out of Ampang Road, it, yeah. it still appears very majestic. And yes, yes, for sure. Uh, so there, there is still that element of uh, majesty that mm. we felt uh, today, and probably more so than the Oriental building. Yeah, but I imagine as well, because when the Rubber Research Institute was set up, it was set up over a huge complex mm. because they were meant to do research on rubber. So they were planting all sorts of rubber trees, different kinds of species. They were doing all sorts of tests in the labs. Um, so maybe the land as it was given up, so what, what it stands today on the little plot that it stands, mm. it looks a little bit more lost as well, I, said, I guess, in a sense of urban, uh, the urban sighting that it's in. Right swallowed up by other hmm. uh, the, the urban expansion right but yeah I, like even even its distance to Jalan Ampang I mean if you look at this picture it's a sweeping driveway all the way in I wouldn't imagine you you know today you're right up against the fence which sits right up against the building 
So the building like this, the devil is in the details now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Where you get the most delicious expression of what. So happens. let's let's take a look at some of these details, right? Mm -hmm. Now the rubber research building uh, actually used the entire facade as sort of a storytelling piece. Yeah. It tells the story of of the history of rubber, the mm -hmm. process of of planting and cleaning, processing and cleaning up rubber, um, down to the point of um, talking about future rubber, uh, rubber uh, alternatives, right? Synthetic rubber. Synthetic rubber. So the story yeah. of the panel talks about how primitive rubber was sort of like discovered all the way to almost signpost. It's it almost as if it's prophetic in the way it signposts its own demise and prominence yeah. uh, by talking about uh, the development of synthetic rubber. In fact, mm -hmm. it brought a Singapore-based Italian artist by the name of Rudolfo Noli uh, to uh, and commission, com uh, uh, you know, Rudolfo was sort of like commissioned uh, to create this uh, fantastic, uh, you know, seven panel relief. Uh, yeah. uh, but that's, that's really the main sort of like story art of rubber. Uh, beyond that, there are also all these other tiny little, uh, decorative sort of like features uh, mm. that uh, I think, uh, you know, really accentuates and adds something to uh, the building. And I don't know, Yvonne, you want to sort of share some of it? Yeah, like, I mean, even this simple uh, motif here is actually sheets of rubber drying. Mm -hmm. um, and that simple motif is actually repeated even on the, the door of the main entrance. Like you see it in a different form but they still talk about that process of drying rubber. Um, so it actually still, uh, you know, still talks about, recognizes that history and that importance of rubber for the country, uh, just simply by having all these uh, ornaments on the buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, another, another Art Deco feature to point out are these bands uh, where you see that are in triplets. So triplets are actually a very, um, quite a, an identifying Art Deco feature. So there seems to be an obsession with things in threes. It could be some Egyptian influence or, or something like that in the past or, or that comes with the Art Deco. Uh, I think thinking... you know, if you line three lines together, what it seems to convey is also speed and mm. uh, a sense of uh, movement, right? Uh, yes. You get almost like, you know, a horizontal sort of like bend cutting across the building. There's almost, it's bringing the building into motion. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but they also use it uh, trees it vertically as well yeah, so it could be three flagpoles or you know three bands of windows or something like that it's all oh, trees the triplets are the thing to look up for lah. yeah so very in very quick succession like we said a couple of buildings the anglo oriental is the other one this is just in uh, on jalan tangsi which was known as barrack road at that time um, the anglo oriental was one of the largest tin mining groups in malaya at that time um, I don't know at what point it became Wisma Ikran, but it had a central courtyard inside. So behind the facade, there was a central courtyard that links all the internal spaces. Um, but as far as we know, that courtyard was then later on closed up and then a mezzanine floor was added when Makota College took over in 88. Um, the main playful reference to Tin was principally the entranceway where they used to have an entire entrance door made out of Tin. With, yeah. Uh, of course, repeat with all the reliefs that references mm. the tin mining past. Yeah. So here in the front entrance, like you said, we've got these vertical elements that go up, including three flagpoles. And then on the left and right flanked sides, okay. we've got this horizontal eyebrow that goes along. Okay. And then just as a point of interest, we also see these horizontal bendings at the bottom. So are these eyebrows too? Well, you can't have too many eyebrows on a face. So in fact, these horizontal <laughs> bands are called, um, they're just yeah. called horizontal bands. <laughs> um, the, real, <laughs> the real true eyebrow is the one right on top. So it's the one that frames your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. see Busy Building is another very well-known building by Coltman. Um, it it's got a similar- more festive here. <laughs> Yeah, they've got some flags all decked out, maybe celebrating something in, in, in KL at that time. Probably the coronation of uh, mm. King George the Sixth, if I know my British history correctly. <laughs> Came by, yeah, yeah. Um, so as, you, as we were talking about, like we were comparing it with the Lee rubber building earlier, where the, the building addressed the corner by a sharp chamfer. This one was kind of a more gentle curve around the corner. 
So you, you can see that very, very clearly accentuated and articulated by the horizontal bands. You see that curve really clear as it sweeps across from Market Street to Rogers Street. Yeah. And I think there is a slow sort of like transition, right? Uh, with this sort of like nice smooth uh, curve, mm. uh, especially with the next building you're going to feature. Or are you going to show the ornamental design? Oh yeah, we can see some of the details. Right, okay. Yeah. And then with so, the next Oh yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So in, in 2016, as we as we know, Think City uh, took over the building, um, and they did quite a fair bit of restoration and refurbishment. Um, they kept many of the building's features, including this band of playful mosaics here, right at the stairwell. Uh, they also kept this logo, original logo of the OCBC Bank, which is the Chinese junk boat. So they've kept all those elements, and building looks very fresh and clean today, uh, including its eyebrows and flagpoles. But this building, the Odeon, didn't have such, uh, didn't have such good fit, did it? No. It, uh, uh, today, it's uh, you know, pretty much covered up. Like. You wouldn't mm. need that whole sense of squatness, right? That defines this type of art deco structure with also the vertical uh, sort of like... Uh, uh, what do you call those? Those vertical sort of like slats coming down. Or just like the, the columns that are going up. Yeah, mm. yeah I, I think cinemas, cinemas were a really popular uh, typology during that time. Uh, the Shaw brothers, of course, they, 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 were, they were creating this massive empire or network of, of cinemas right across the peninsula. Mm -hmm. So cinemas were built very quickly uh, and they were used as statement pieces. So a lot of them uh, were very easily adopted the style of the day. Um, and we would actually find a lot of uh, cinemas that still stand like that uh, up in Penang, I believe. Exactly. Especially yeah. in the 1930s, the heyday of the talkies, right? When sound was first introduced, that was when cinema became wildly, wildly popular. In fact, uh, one of the oldest cinema, I think it was called the Isis in Ipoh, uh, hmm. actually also took on an Egyptian theme. Uh, yeah. so there are all these sort of like quirky little, uh, you know, expression of uh, cosmopolitan references that, uh, you know, finds its way, especially into uh, cinema yeah. halls of the day, where mm. it's a palaces of dreams, essentially. Yeah. So, well, we, I don't know what's going to happen to the audience, but as it stood back then, it was quite a, quite an imposing structure. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Here's another building on Jalan Ampang. Um, it's called Harrison's and Crossfield. Um, Harrison's and Crossfield were they were in uh, distributors. Yeah. distributors. Uh. I think distributors. Yeah. They're still in round. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. Uh, yeah. But this building is particularly interesting again in how it addresses the corner that it sits on. But it, it addresses it by making this bold circular form, taking on this form, and then extending it all the way back, almost like a ship. So it's got very strong ship naval yeah. reference in it. Uh, yeah. I think this is where you start seeing a kind of slow transition away from the classical kind of uh, verticality of art deco, fascination with sort of like vertical lines towards mm. horizontal, streamlined, modern look, yeah. right? that you would see more and more in the post-war period. Yeah. So it's even as we see here again, those kind of horizontal bandings that goes right across. There you go. Yeah, there's your eyebrow. That actually marks the building. And then, and then that vertical. Have the yeah, that's right. The ship mass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if you look at the date, 1939, if you know in history, that's when World War II started happening. Um, so again, there was a period of almost 10 years where nothing much happened. Uh, in fact, Copeman left, well, he was, he was a prisoner of war. He was interned in Changi Prison in, in, in Singapore. And when he made it a life out of prison, he got onto a ship and said, I'm never coming back. <laughs> I'm never coming back here again. That was how broken his spirit was at the end of the war. Well, what? Uh, look at what? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. That's right, what happened? Yeah, so he, he went back to London and the story goes that he was sitting at a bar and he was having a drink and he got a phone call 
uh, somebody had called him to say, hey, you know, now that the war is over, we want to set up our offices in, in the Far East again. Mm -hmm. So is Butia Network still in practice? Um, and he started getting more calls like that. And he realized there, there is actually work left to be done in KL, in Malaya. In fact, more. Came, <laughs> and in fact, more, it became a really like, you know, busy period for them. Mm -hmm. um, so where he left off at Harrison's and Crossfield, on the other side of the road, 20 years later, he built this building, the South Engineers. Mm -hmm. And this building, 20 years later, has started taking on a little bit, uh, it started growing a bit in terms of its style. Um, it's got uh, potholes, as you can see here on the side. Mm -hmm. These kind of uh, pothole windows. Also with naval references, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it's more naval, more prominent naval references even now. It still maintains that vertical kind of like um, uh, a pylon on one side. Yeah. But now the horizontal banding has gone all around. It's no longer yeah. just at the top of the windows anymore. It's actually wrapping around the windows and goes all across, up and down every floor. So it's a different expression of that. Uh, that, that kind of uh, streamlineness. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so apart from apart from Coltman, so those are quite some of his uh, very prominent buildings that Coltman left us, and a lot of us know them, because if you see these buildings, it's it's kind of in your face, right? Mm. Uh, but here's one that was not done by Coltman; it's done by T Y Lee. T Y Lee um, was with the Board of Sanitation at that time. The KL Board of Sanitation then later became City Hall. Uh, but he designed this market uh, for an, what was an open-air wet market at Old Market Square. Uh, that's why the name Old Market Square, right? Uh, so they, they relocated them and built this building. For Actually, for many years, it went through a, quite a bad state of decline. Um, you know, even all these like, uh, the, but the stepped ziggurats and all these kind of uh, features, even these stepped op uh, reverse ziggurat for the openings, you know, some of these uh, kind of reliefs and all, uh, they were still actually there. So mm -hmm. in, um, I think Chen Vun Fi was the one who did the restoration for the central market. Uh, he came in and he did a, a massive exercise. And today it's, it's one of KL's top Nine tourism spot. Yeah, 1987 or something like that. Yeah, that's right, in the 80s. Yeah. Okay. We also want to show you some freestanding objects. It's not just all buildings in KL. Um, we have here for you three, three things that we have discovered. There is the cenotaph that didn't originally stand in Taman Tugu or Bukit Tugu. It used to be further down the road, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the railway station. Yeah, near the railway station. Um, and it was moved here later on. So that was designed by Stark and McNeil. Uh, Stark and McNeil, of course, uh, did quite a few Art Deco buildings in Penang as yeah. well. Yeah. Penang was, he, was, yeah. was he with, uh, which firm was he with? Sorry? Stark and, Stark McNeil. and McNeil. Which yeah. firm was he? That's a film itself. Oh, they are, oh they are, okay. Yeah, right. they are a film from mm. yeah. Yeah. Then, of course, we have this very prominent uh, clock tower that sits on Medan Pasa, if you go today. Um, and that was designed by Koopman. Um, it was it was some royalty was visiting. Uh, yeah, probably. Oh, I that's probably the either George the sixth or was it Edward? I don't know. It was um, to commemorate. Uh, it was to commemorate something. <laughs> the coronation, commemorate. Yeah. <laughs> but then there was also the application, so I I keep confusing between. Uh, I, that's my bad for not. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> so the, well. <laughs> the wooden doors here um, actually have a very prominent sunburst motif. Um, so you can actually still go and see it. it's actually been kept in and has actually been kept in pretty good condition, this uh, clock mm -hmm. tower. And the whole market square is still a very lively uh, gathering spot. Yes. And migrant workers who wouldn't and wouldn't would look out of place. It uh, wouldn't be very dissimilar to how it would look like back then as well. Mm, like, mm, continue to yep. you know, serve as a sort of like gathering. Yeah. Uh, gathering, yeah, gathering square almost. And I think it was a good uh, a good part on DBKL to turn that whole thoroughfare into just a pedestrian only. It just keeps all the smog and all the vehicles and the traffic out of the way so people can actually just walk and enjoy that space. 
But what I'm most, most, most fascinated by is your discovery. So only because you belong to the church <laughs> and have access to this beautiful piece of object. Can you tell us more about this? Object? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, this, this is a baptismal font that is actually a small little thing that's in the middle of St. Mary's Cathedral in Datara Medica. St. Mary's Cathedral, of course, is a, 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 a class one heritage building in our country. It's, it's under the, the National Heritage Act. Um, and this baptismal font, nobody knew anything about it. We, we use it often for baptisms and all. But it was one day during a wedding when my kids were playing around it and I saw this, this bronze plug. And it hit me. Is this the same Coltman that I've been reading about <laughs> and been researching about? Um, and it actually does. Every, all the names line up. His name, Eo Coltman, is down here. Um, this, was, this font was actually dedicated by him and his mother. And it was actually in memory of both his brothers uh, who died in the war. One who died in the war and one who died in South Africa where Coltman is from. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think there is any doubt that he would have designed this himself. He would have taken it very personally and he would have designed it. But it was also done in such a, such a low-key way in memorial of his brothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's something to... <laughs> something fun that was discovered along the way. Okay, so where are we going next? Uh, we're expanding outwards, right? Thinking about the legacy of Art Deco and, and thinking about Art Deco in, uh, in much more broader terms, in terms of how it sort of seeps into the urban landscape of KL and also other towns in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. so we have a map. Is yes. So we haven't been able to show you everything. I think uh, this, you know, the length of this yeah, Zoom, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to make it. So what Simon actually has been doing very extensively over months and months, this is part of his, um, his tenacity <laughs> and his <laughs> passion. Uh? <laughs> I'm here, Matthew. <laughs> uh, so he's actually been, been slowly mapping out Art Deco buildings, modern buildings, or things that he finds along the way. And he's, he's, he's put them into a map that we can now uh, share with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so la later on, we will we'll share a link with you on how you can actually get you know, access to this map as well. But just a quick uh, kind of like a guided tour of how to navigate through this. Um, as you can see, Art Deco buildings in KL, they are green markers and orange markers. We have isolated the orange markers as the ones that were designed by Eo Koopman, um, quite a few of which we have covered. The green markers are for buildings that were not done by Koopman. So there is uh, you know, a handful of people uh, that were designing buildings, uh, Art Deco buildings as well. But the most prolific guy, the guy that you want, that's Koopman. So he's down here. So what about these buildings? What do we know about them? You can just click on one of them to find out. Say this one, what, what did I say? The Hopal Ward in Tongshin Hospital. Did you know there was a, an Art Deco structure there? Well, I didn't. I didn't know before. <laughs> <laughs> but because of, of Simon's map, I went and, and looked it up. And this is what it looks like, the Hopal Ward. The Hopal Ward was, um, was funded by Aubun Hall and Aubun Pa. Of the famous uh, Hall Pa oh, Villa yeah. in Singapore. And Tiger Balm, Tiger Balm. <laughs> Tiger Balm, that's right. <laughs> Tiger Balm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually right next to it, there's another, uh, there's another uh, ward as well in, in Tongshin Hospital that has got Art Deco features. Right. So this is one way that you can actually explore and see what other things are out there, right? Um, another example that we have here. Here's one by Copeman, which is very little known. The KL Book Club. And Simon, this would be this would predate 1930. The book club was in the 20s, the late 20s. Are you, are you sure? I thought it was in 1939. Yeah. No. No, I think it was uh, uh, oh, 39. Yeah, okay, the, okay. the thing was 39. The, yeah, yeah. The, the club was formed earlier. But the building was only completed in 39. Uh. But yeah. today it's, I think, a storeroom. La, of, and then the library uh, you know, occupies the building next, uh, a much larger sort of like building next to it. Right, right. But it's also, they've also extended it. It's gone two stories now. But you can still see some traces of Art Deco on the facade. There's still some things there. Um, but know that before all that, in among the trees facing the, facing the Dataran, there was actually this really cute little book club, which actually has a huge 
uh, huge collection of books. The main yeah. library in KL. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Or how about somewhere like say Lebo Pasar? So these are some buildings that uh, that have been identified, but in fact we don't know anything much more about them. Mm -hmm. So um, it's also marked on the map, so you can go and look it up and see. Oh, I see the flagpole. I recognize some Art Deco features. Um, and this is a series of three buildings that's on Lebo Pasar. Um, I think the... they don't always fit into the typology, right? You know, yeah. might have features that are more modern, but then retain certain features that, okay, you can clearly identify as uh, Art Deco, as in the flagpoles or the use of the eyebrow, but then mm -hmm. really pat down uh, to perhaps suggest that they were built at a later period and that, you know, whatever taxonomy that we have is approximation at best. Uh, mm. uh, and while useful as a guide to help us to distinguish stylistic features, sometimes, you know, we have to uh, recognize that the fact that uh, expression, a uh, stylistic expression is a lot more of a style. Mm. Mm. Yep. You're on the ground. At least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here are more examples. This is in uh, Jalan Balai. Yeah. As this one little structure. I think it's, I think today it's become something else and it's been painted over. Mm. Um, and then this group of three buildings here in Medan Pasa, just next to the clock tower. Yeah. So there are like the ziggurat stepped, uh, stepping roof on the parapet. You can see a lot, you know, the vertical elements. So even though these shop houses are actually very narrow, um, there is still space for that kind of expression mm. using this style. Yeah. Sometimes specimens are a little bit hard to find. Um, like this one here. Smack right in Chinatown. Right in the middle of Chinatown. When Chinatown used to look like this in the yeah, 1950s. Hokkien Chai, right? Yeah, Hokkien Chai. Yeah. Hokkien Chai. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, was a, this was a landmark, right? If you went to Pataling Street, you tell people, you know, oh, I'll meet you there at that building with the, with the flagpole on the top. But today, uh, with the with the... Awning. Rain yeah. shelter, uh, it's kind of blocked it quite a bit. So you have to look up beyond all the umbrellas and all uh, to find this building, which amazingly the shape uh, has has actually lasted for quite a bit. Uh, yeah, it's still maintained. Although I was, I, I'm sure it wasn't red to begin with. <laughs> um, yeah. So what about beyond KL? Mm. So we have a bit of stuff also mapped out in Ipo, but this is also... Uh, uh, it's less sort of like uh, developed than the Penang map. Uh, this is a rudimentary uh, kind of map, uh, principally involving, uh, because, you know, at, the, uh, at many different points uh, during the mapping process, it was still not easy to sort of travel around uh, uh, owing to my sort of like busy work schedule. So I was doing a lot of Google Street View mapping and really clicking and coasting up and down Google Street View, using Google Street View to coast up and down like, you know, uh, an entire town, searching for uh, distinguishable sort of like features that uh, I could pinpoint as Art Deco mm -hmm. and, um, you know, create a shape file so that we at least mark that territory uh, yeah. so that we, in future, where there's more information forthcoming about uh, the structure, we can uh, mm. uh, uh, input that into the map. Yeah, so, so Ipo still lacks quite a bit of information and, and research. But for example, you can click on one of these uh, shape files and then you, there's a little bit of, of uh, description as to what it was. It was the, well, it is huh? the ISIS uh, cinema, also known as the Rex. Um, Having said that, uh, Ipo World, which is a fantastic database, has done yes, a lot of yes. work. Uh, yep. So kudos to them. And uh, we also want to sort of acknowledge them as, as, uh, as a reference point. Uh. Yeah, yeah. I think what's interest, what I found interesting is while doing research is there are actually many, many small groups of people who have shown, uh, you know, like interest in all these kind of things, but it just seems to be a, a lack of like a coordinator or someone to just put it all together in a place that we can see in one go if we needed to. Mm -hmm. so, so moving up, yeah. This is an opportunity to kind of galvanize <laughs> the Calvary, right? Yeah. <laughs> So up in Penang, now, of course, as we would expect, there's, there's quite a lot in Penang, isn't it? No, no, um, the spread in Penang is yeah. so, 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 so much more 
extensive uh, and also the variety as well. So I think KL and Penang is a nice sort of like comparison, whereas KL, you really get some of the larger, uh, more monumental uh, structures being built. Penang, the, the Art Deco building and expression uh, takes, um, takes on a much more medium or smaller scale, but in terms of variety, you can't beat it. Lah. Uh, so you have terrace houses, you have temples being sort of, um, uh, you know, designed in an Art Deco style. You have smaller wet markets also taking on Art Deco expression, not just a mm. obvious looking uh, central market, for example. Yeah. Uh, also you have bus temple, you have like Malay association, uh, cultural associations also, you know, uh, occupying Art Deco buildings. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a lot more sort of like range and diversity. Yeah, but I also think that because Georgetown is a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site, there's also a lot more concerted effort um, in, in doing these kind of things to map out, to, to keep track of history um, and to know and, and identify these kind of uh, buildings and typologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we zoom in to Georgetown, um, you've, actually, you've actually categorized it a bit different from how you've, you've done KL, haven't you? Yeah, actually, there are two ways of expressing it. I can easily switch to the KL, the, the type categorization, or mm -hmm. in this instance, we choose another way of expressing it, which is true function. So true function, you get a different sort of like way of categorizing the buildings according to the function of the building, right? What it's right. being used for, as opposed to type, uh, which uh, describes the building as either a standalone building or a shop house, uh, so that you can understand the uh, yeah, how the building structure looks. Mm. So when I when I clicked on this commerce and trade, uh, what popped up was a whole list of buildings, and presumably the ones that are marked out in yellow uh, would fall under this building category. And a there's a whole list here. Uh, many of them are just addresses. Mm -hmm. So the ones with address, I would imagine, actually, there's no further data that has been. Uh, logged into the map. Shop houses then. So yeah. if you change the uh, categorization to type, they will mostly exist as shop houses. Because right, shop right. houses are basically uh, units that I don't really have much more information about. Okay. So like, for example, one of these is not just an address. It's got a name, India House. You see that one there? So what is it? If you click on it, it will show you that, give you a bit of detail. It's an Indian Art Deco style, finished in Shanghai plaster, designed by Sokolingam and Chetiar. So that's just a short, quick description about that building. And if we zoomed in even further to Georgetown, maybe just looking at this concentration of orange buildings here, um, that particular one is the OCBC Bank in Lebo Pantai, uh, designed in 1938. Mm -hmm. um, and the one next to it is Ban Hin Lee Bank, Mm -hmm. Also similar time, 1936. Yeah. Let's not forget like the everything east of Beach Street, uh, which is the main central commercial thoroughfare, mm. uh, was built on a landfill, right? Mm. That's uh, right. In the late 19th century to early 20th century. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it really uh, you know captures the it, it really is a bit of a time capsule. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how do you access this map? Um, you're going to find the link popping up in the chat uh, in a short while. So you can actually find it. If, you, if not, you can do a screen capture here. It's just a very easy uh, link to remember, bit.ly modern, modern with an E, modern Malaysia. And once you load this map, it's going to look something like this if you're running it on your browser, on the phone, or it's going to look like this when it loads on uh, the Google Map app on your phone. Now, what this will allow you to do is when you're in that area, you can pull up the map and you can do a self-guided walking tour. You can be walking past some of these. You may choose to follow only, only the Coltman buildings. You may choose to follow only the, the better well-known buildings or you want to go chase down the unknown ones. It's up yeah, to you. Houses. <laughs> the club houses, right? Um, in fact, you know, your next holiday, cancel your flight ticket and just go straight up to Penang. There's so much to discover over there. No need to go too far away. Mm -hmm. um, so you can still use this map and go around. So we, we hope that you actually will explore and discover more for yourselves. Now, but before we end, we want to close with a story of how buildings can evolve. 
Here's a story about one called the Fu Fui Chiu Association Building. A very few of us know about it. Uh, we may have heard the name. Sounds vaguely familiar. Now, where have I heard that before? Yeah. That's that the <laughs> reaction I got from Simon, right? <laughs> no, that sounds really familiar, but I can't put my finger on That's it. That's right. So the, the Fui Chus, they were the biggest clan of Chinese tin miners in KL. Now, Yap Alloy was one of them. He was from this clan. So they decided they needed a building for the association. They had a very prominent site. And so they built it 1930s, Art Deco style. You've got ziggurat parapet roofs, vertical elements, you know, long, sleek horizontal bands. But when, by the time 1960s rolled around, 30 years later, they read, they've run out of space. So they, they extended the building. Uh, and I don't know if you notice what's happened here. They've basically added one entire floor right on top. They just added one floor extended all those stuff just you can even see where the plaster starts and stops right where the old and new meets they just went up copy paste at one more floor 1961 and then in 1992 this happened as far as we know the whole building was completely demolished to build this 13-story structure um, they still maintain the name i believe they still use some floors of it uh, they, there was a shopping center downstairs for a bit. Um, but it almost seemed like, you know, to have taken a step back to the Colosseum in Rome or, or, or even has gone to some eclectic uh, style at the moment or I don't know what. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm so postmodern. So yeah. this is what it looks like today. Um, nothing like what it looked like originally. Um, Much more of that now, no? so perhaps a more... Sorry. Sorry, what was that? Much more pat down. Yeah, I think it also moves to the, the style of the time, isn't it? Right. So these days we are more into blacks and greys and whites. <laughs> so maybe it's actually responding to, to what the, the style of the time, which is also kind of what's, what's happened here, right? Art Deco, and then this and that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we're at. But ultimately, you know, this is the Sulaiman building on Damansara Road. Uh, Damansara Road here now heads down to Victory Avenue, known as Jalan Sultan Hishamuddin. The Asian Arbitration Centre meets here. So not everything needs to be new. Not everything needs to maximise plot ratios. And uh, I believe surely in our country, we have room to let history keep standing tall and teach future generations of where we have come from and from where we can be going. And so, sensitively around such building, the building can still stand on its own. Yeah. And yeah, say something about this past. Yeah. No traffic, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. okay, that's the, I think that's the end of our formal presentation. Uh, yeah. We'll pass the time back to uh, Anand, who's just going to pop right in now, and we're going to do a Q&A. Yes, Thanks. I'm here. Where are we? Hang on. Um, well, thank you very much, Simon and, and uh, Yvonne. That was a wonderful overview and, and great photographs. And, and um, I love the, the, the flagpoles and eyebrows. I think uh, not many people really uh, understood it in that way. So I, I think it's a good, um, uh, good way to actually um, start appreciating uh, these wonderful, uh, beautiful buildings. So um, uh, it's question and answers. We've got a number of questions from, from, from various people in the, in the audience. Um, I'll start off with, uh, with one question. It's, it's a general question, actually. Um, in Malaysia, there are groups of people who are not very supportive of colonial history. I don't know why. You know, they, they might want to, they're more nationalist and, and things like that. So um, for better or worse, um, we have to acknowledge our history in, in some way or other, especially our built history. So what do you think, either of you, um, how could Art Deco buildings become an important part of Malaysia's architectural heritage in the face of such opposition or such sentiments? What do you think? You want, do you, you think it's, it's worth you're... saving? Um, I, I, I would, personally, I'll, I'll just go very quickly, I would 
mm-hmm. caution uh, against creating straw men, right? Uh, in, in terms of how we view oppositions to uh, things we believe to be valuable uh, in terms of our built heritage. And I, 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 I'm infinitely sort of like much more generous in trying to believe that, you know, there's always a intercultural or cross-cultural sort of like, you know, point where we can draw meaning from. So maybe it's the way we tell the story. If we were to tell the story as simply heritage that belongs to, you know, this is a Chinese building or this is a building that belongs to this Tauke or that's a building that belongs to, you know, the British people, then clearly, uh, you know, a sense of that, that, that sense of collective communal ownership wouldn't come out of the way we tell the story in a very narrow uh, sort of like, with a true, a very narrow sort of like communal narrative. But what if we would think as a building, as a site where different communities interacted? Mm. Uh, the use of the building is, you know, much more versatile, all of them over and beyond how an architect can imagine you know, its intention and function. And if we use that as a starting point, maybe that can encourage a much more imaginative sort of ways of thinking about how buildings actually figure in everyone's mm-hmm. life. Yeah, I, I think the preservation of, of memories uh, does not need to be tied to an, an object. Um, there's actually many things we can remember. But this, this obsession about writing off, cancelling our history, the parts that we don't like or the things that we disagree mm-hmm. seems to be so prevalent in how we approach history these days. Mm-hmm. What I don't like, I'll just cancel out. You know, what I, what I wish didn't happen, let's just forget it. Um, and that's, that shouldn't be the way because why should we be so um, afraid of what happened in the past? In fact, what happened in the past should actually inform us in how we want to go towards the future. You know, if you want to cancel out everything based on what you are now, well, you know, my friend, you'll be stuck in a really low trajectory because you've got nothing to propel you forward. Um, so that's, I mean, that's my view on... on, on so, but, but do you think um, that uh, it would be important to, um, like, to do what Simon is doing, to, to map out all these Art Deco buildings and then educate people more about it so that... that um, um, people understand that these are actually uh, buildings that, that were part of Malaysia's architectural history. Yeah, I think the map is, is a really great place to start. If anything, it puts in one place for anyone to be able to access that this is that collection of Art Deco modern buildings that we have. But whether it means that every one of these markers are meant to be buildings to be saved, mm. um, we need to be able to to be able to exercise judgment in where we draw the line. Not everything is uh, heritage heritageable. Does that, does that word exist? <laughs> you know, I mean, in all honesty, from personal experience. So as I as I mentioned earlier, I I go to St Mary's Cathedral Church, uh, Cathedral in Datara Merdeka. It's a class one heritage building in Malaysia, but it is a real pain to upkeep. <laughs> There yeah. are so many rules and laws that governs how and what we can do. So there's that struggle between the users of the building or the yeah. owners of the building. And actually, in fact, how much funds you have to put in in order to preserve it in a way that would be, you know, uh, correct for its status. Yeah. I mean, heritage is a, is a big topic that we need to address. It's a big, uh, um, uh, it's a bigger uh, narrative and a bigger con- conversation. You know? The next question is from Nisha. Um, from Baden Warisan. Um, she said um, in the previous talk last week, um, the speaker mentioned a north south axis um, in Mumbai um, because Mumbai is actually a, 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 a north south uh, city in, in that sense, you know. So, but, but a, 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 a very um, visual north south axis existed or, or emerged is there a, a, an actual pattern in Kuala Lumpur I mean what do you think in terms of uh, the, the spread of other deco buildings why but but Mumbai's topography is very distinct right it's made up of landfills that connects uh, several islands together so that you get this long trunk that uh, connects that extends upwards uh, from from the islands uh, 
uh, where the British first sort of like settled and created the port city of Bombay, right? Uh, so, so that has a very geographically specific sort of feature. Uh, whereas KL, I, uh, I don't know, I think I couldn't quite sort of like figure out until I think Yvonne, your map really gave some clue as to how we can understand the expansion of KL. And that is the, the motorist map really highlights that there's this trunk road that's been developing where KL became a node that connects the north to the south. But uh, essentially the expansion doesn't just, it's not a direct north-south sort of like expansion, but it's more, uh, it, it's centripetal, right? From the center northward, and but then also to the southeast down towards Pudu where it, uh, mm. yeah, slides down to south all the way down to Singapore. So it would be interesting to actually uh, 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 see this, how, how it, it can be analyzed in that sense, you know, and, and uh, we tie it with social history as well. I right. think, I think. And I think the development of like the, the expansion of like the motorway, the fact that motor, mot motorists were also becoming tourists yeah. that were coming through KL. So they weren't just relying on the railway that brought in people from Klang, but they weren't just, uh, you know, it, it wasn't just shipping that was, uh, you know, driving tourist traffic, shipping and railway driving tourist traffic. But mm -hmm. the motorway is facilitating a new way of experiencing and coming through the city that was shaping a new urban expansion and configuration. Good, good. excellent. Now, there's a question from uh, um, one, someone in the audience, Alexander uh, Vidim, Vidim. I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. <laughs> um, he asked, um, are there any of the, or are any of the shown buildings um, heritage in Kale protected? And is there any interest from the authorities to preserve these buildings? Yvonne didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I have no I was like, I was actually going to turn this question back to Anand. Anand, as, uh, yeah. Anand Warisan, are you aware of? <laughs> Anand, well, I, I, on my expertise. <laughs> uh, well, if I were to answer it, I, I would say that um, the there are, I wouldn't say shortcomings, but maybe it hasn't matured enough, but the our our the acts that, that protects all the buildings. Um, one of the things that that is in the act is the uh, establishment of a heritage body, you know, Jawatan uh, Warisan, and they um, sometimes I've spoken to many of them uh, over the over the years, and um, they feel that their hands are often tied um, in, in in terms of heritage. They can only work on on a building to preserve it if someone writes in, if someone, um, if there's a group of people that, that uh, uh, brings to their attention a particular thing, they, they've got a, a very, um, uh, what's the word, a very process orientated um, uh, method to, to preserve buildings, you know? So they, they feel that, that if, if no one brings to, uh, any, any building to their attention, then they can't act. So it's one of those chicken and egg things, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But I was reading the, uh, I think, was it called the, the Ikomor sort of Kuala Lumpur Heritage, Heritage Agenda, which yeah. is like a kind of like a blueprint or a plan, policy plan, policy paper, yeah. uh, which I thought was quite progressive in the way that it actually recognizes the importance of modern buildings and the need to sort of like preserve modern buildings and architecture as part of KL sort of like heritage agenda. Yeah. And in fact, was that, that became one of the central sort of like pillars in which it was advocating for, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. Well, that, yeah like, I mean, if you, if you talk about modernism, it's only like 50, 60 years ago. Exactly. It's actually not that old compared Correct. to Art yeah. Deco, 90 years. And then if you go even further, like, you know, to some of the Indo-Saracenic um, kind of architecture of the KL, KL railway station. So those kind of things, it's like how far back you know, what then do you value? Is it, does it have to be old enough? Does it have to like- Exactly. You know? So, yeah. I, so that's one of the shortcomings in, in Malaysia because we are, we are not a very old uh, nation in that sense. And so uh, people think that um, heritage has to be like 100, 200 years old, you know, or whatever kind mm -hmm. of thing. So if, if it's only uh, 60 years old or 70 years old, um, it still hasn't hit that, um, 
public consciousness as yet, you know. And so I think education, we, we need to educate people about all this. Mm -hmm. The next question is from uh, Simone Constantini. Again, I'm sorry if I, I pronounce it wrongly, but um, I, I guess it's a lady. Uh, she, uh, she says, wish Kale would have followed the Singapore example in terms of preserving, uh, preserving their heritage. So I, I guess it's a comparison between um, Malaysia and Singapore. Yeah. But, uh, Simone, can I just say that we also wish that we would be following Singapore in many, many other aspects as well, not just in terms of preserving heritage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they have a very strong preservation board. And um, having worked in Singapore myself for many years, um, I, I know that, that they make, they take a lot of effort and time to ensure that their built uh, heritage um, is, is maintained, you know, or preserved. The next question uh, uh, to either of you is um, a simple one from Alan Fraser. He just wants to know what style is the KL railway station um, and who built it and, and who was the architect or when was it built and who was the architect? This is a, this is a quiz question for both of you. <laughs> Ooh, railway station? Yeah. 18, 18 something? 18, uh, 19, 19, uh, if I'm not, it's by Hubbard, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, A.B. Hubbard. A.B. Hubbard. Uh, actually, there's a really nice website done by Marina Issa. So I'm going to plug her. Uh, uh, it's called abhubbard.com. Yeah. Uh, I'm, and I might share the link here in the chat box so that, uh, Ellen, you can have a look. Oh, no. How do I do this? Okay. There you go. Uh, so okay. if you look in the chat box, there's a link to the website that Marina has sort of put together and has all the information about uh, the railway station, which unfortunately falls slightly before the period that we have, we're, we're talking about. But all the information is there and it's a lovely website and a lovely archive. Good, excellent. Uh, we've got a few more questions. Um, uh, my buddy, Zach, he's asked this question. He says that there are many bungalows and low-rise buildings that, that are in the Art Deco style, um, but many of these are fast disappearing. I think it relates to uh, something we talked about earlier. Um, how are we going to preserve these and, and, um, and how do we put an endangered uh, um, you know, list on them. And then I think you're reading a question for you yourself to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think if, if I could, if I could chip in on this, yeah. it's, it's difficult to talk about individual bungalows and single dwelling units. Um, it may, unless it's of a very fine and exam, example of the art deco or, or of any particular style, it's very difficult to say you know, preserve it, don't do anything and leave it as it is. The way how Singapore has done it um, in that area with that Art Deco, uh, with that coffee place, that it was a whole cluster of flats. Um, uh, you mean Tiong Bahru? Tiong Bahru, thank you. That whole Tiong Bahru area is not just one building, but it's, a, it's the way how that cluster of buildings evolved and how they still stand together that, was, that became so important to preserve because it was also preserving how the buildings relate to each other, how the roads go and all that. But if it was only a single standing building, I think even in Singapore, um, they would actually, you know, may, may not be so slow in just wiping it off and, and building a fresh on the site. Um, so to some extent, we also need to have a, a gradation of, in terms of our heritage, uh, what's one, two, three, class one, two, three. And actually when you are able to grade that, then we are able to see what's a better specimen. If we had limited resources to, to do conservation and preservation, where well, would we put those resources? Right. Excellent. I, I, think, I think that that's certainly something that we, we need to do. I, I, I was speaking to Simon earlier. Um, I think it's important for Malaysia and KL, maybe Penang itself, uh, to have an art deco society, you know, and, and something like what Mumbai is doing in, in other parts. Uh, as well, because I, I personally feel that um, Art Deco is such an important part of our built uh, heritage. Well, you know? whatever work that we've done is building on the work that so many other people have been doing. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, someone, in, someone including, all the anonymous, uh, including all the anonymous Instagrammers yes. uh, who has been posting fantastic, fantastic. Uh, not, not forgetting Skyscraper City, right? Skyscraper. That's such a great forum. Uh, you yeah. know, your, 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 your bourgeois public sphere, right? Of the internet, <laughs> of the internet age where you can just, you know, hear snippets of information. And, yes. uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I, we know that there's a, 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 a mass out there. Uh, maybe it uh, it's time to for some sort of like coordination to yeah yeah very good mm. okay I've got two more questions and then I think we can uh, we should wrap it up um, uh, Zach has another question about uh, um, other parts uh, other types of art deco so he, he mentions uh, tombstones he feels that there are many art deco tombstones um, in 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 Malaysia and and um, uh, his grandmother. Tombstone is an Art Deco style. So, um, is that any? Has there been any work on that, or, or has not has that, um, that been mapped out in any way? But no, no, not at all. Uh, well, that's an area that we have looked at. Uh, but actually, uh, as I was working on the map, one of the first thing that was always on top of my mind was a a, a, a tombstone belonging to Stella Con, a playwright. Yeah. Our grandfather who, in Bukit Brown that was constantly in my mind the sunburst motif that's been yeah. used, and, but that's a, in a Singapore context. But mm. I would imagine, uh, you know, you would find similar types. Yeah, of I, I think it's something that that um, can be added to the categories of art yeah. deco in mm. Malaysia. Yeah, easily another layer, you know, just of of yeah. objects in that sense. Okay. And people but, can, uh, I think, the beauty of a of a of a map like this is other people can actually contribute to it. You know, yeah. that, that information it's a is not, thing. Yeah. yeah, it's not limited or it's not someone's possession or someone's copyright. Yeah. It's actually meant for everyone to be building on in, in order for us to have information that's accessible as well. Yeah. So it's a community thing. Yeah, that's very good. Now, um, last question is um, from Joyce Cole. She wants to know what would be your personal favorite building um, or you have a soft spot for in... I guess Kuala Lumpur or Penang. Art deco, art deco building, of course. Yeah. <laughs> to put you on the spurs. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. I do like Wisma Ikran very much, to be honest. Yeah, me too. I, I love it. And where it stands, there is there is something really nice about how nothing has actually encroached into it. Yeah. It still stands very beautifully in that corner. That there's no high rise that has slowly engulfed it and swallowed it up, um, yeah. and it's I'm I'm just waiting for the day that someone will just take over, and you know fix it up and turn it into another public space again. I think that will be that will be my building. Yeah, good. Well, well thank favorite, you very much. That sorry, Simon. Well, my favorite building is behind me. So. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It was my favorite as well when I was. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much uh, to both of you for a very wonderful talk. I, I think, uh, and I hope that uh, um, it, it doesn't, um, it's probably the first of a series of, of talks. And um, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to actually um, thank a number of people who have helped in, in uh, putting all this together. Um, there's people in Baden Weissan, uh, Vanessa, Amira, Rosniza, um, Nisha was the, the leader of this whole uh, program and, and, and um, her, it was her interest to get this uh, series moving. So I, I thank Nisha very much for, for uh, all your contributions and your leadership. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the speakers, both of you. I think you, you've got such uh, amazing um, uh, knowledge about what's happening. And, and, and I'm very, very impressed that, that you all are putting it all together in, in some meaningful way to help uh, um, it grow, that our knowledge about it. Um, I hope, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who attended. I think, I think that's amazing um, that um, there are so many people who are, who are interested in Art Deco and, and um, as well as uh, uh, what, what's been happening to uh, heritage in, in, in Malaysia. Um, we, there, there are many more talks that are coming up. Uh, please uh, um, 
check up check up our website and, and see what's happening uh, um, do participate more if you're not a member join us um, please follow button Morrison Malaysia on our website you can subscribe to our newsletter Jendela Morrison or to follow us on Facebook or Instagram uh, our social media um, for more information about upcoming events um, don't uh, button voice and Malaysia is an independent non-government organization and we do not re uh, receive any financial support from the government so if you have any if you have enjoyed today's talk and uh, wish to support our educational and advocacy work please donate to button and uh, details are available here on the screen and uh, then Thank you very much for uh, in advance if, if you're, you've already donated or subscribed or, or uh, become a member or, or you participate in all in our events. So thank you so much. Uh, once again, thank you uh, to Yvonne and Simon. Uh, and for thank you, Adan, talk. for moderating. Yes. Thank all right. Thank, thank you. you. So, uh, good evening to everyone. Thank you.